Our second speaker, Laszlo Fraser, if you can share your screen and, and we'll jump straight into your talk. So when you're ready, please. Hi, I'm Laszlo from Monash. Um, so thank you, Bronson, for organizing and thank you everyone for joining us today. And my presentation is going to be um, about light fusion. So if you were here for um, Elham's talk, I think in December, then that should be familiar, but I will, will give an introduction as well. Um, so I wanted to start out by acknowledging um, our undergraduate students, David and, and Sherry, who have done all of the calculations that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so I'm gonna start out here by rehashing briefly the major problems in photovoltaics. And then I'm going to talk about um, what is exciton fusion, also known as triplet annihilation upconversion or photochemical upconversion or OJ recombination or whatever you choose to call it. Um, and how does that address some of our problems in photovoltaics? And I'm going to describe the algorithm that we use for our research and what that has taught us about the alignment of energy levels in fusion systems um, and the importance of quenching. Uh, so that's concentration quenching in fusion systems. And then finally, the advantages of quantum dot sensitization for exciton fusion systems. All right, so um, solar cells use light from the sun, which has a spectrum like this. So uh, there's infrared light and there's ultraviolet light and quite a bit in between. Um, and the way the solar cell works is it has a band gap, which is the threshold that determines whether the light is used or not. Uh, so typically, if it's a commercial device, then your threshold is around 1100 nanometers or 1.1 electron volts. So that's the A property of silicon. And all of the photons that are above this energy um, are at least attempted to be converted into electrical current. And then all the photons below that energy are thrown out. Um, so the, the two issues here are we're discarding a bunch of photons that have low energy. And then we have a bunch of high energy photons, so these really blue and ultraviolet ones where most of the energy in the photon is lost and we only get out about 1.1 electron volts at best from that photon. So um, those are the two biggest challenges in making solar cells more efficient, the energy loss of the, from the photons and then the photons that are lost entirely because the energy is too low. Um, so the two strategies for that uh, we call fission and fusion. So in fission, you are taking your photon and splitting it into different parts. And so that's really useful for those very high energy photons that are well above the threshold of the solar cell. And then for fusion, we're taking the low energy photons and we're combining them together to get a higher energy photon. And that's really useful for capturing the low energy photons that are below the threshold. Uh, so here's the conventional Shockley-Quiser detailed balance limit for ordinary solar cells that have one threshold in purple. And if you can use either the fission or the fusion uh, concept, you can achieve a higher theoretical limit on your efficiency. And then um, you know, something like 10, 11% increase in percentage points for your device. Um, so I've sort of roughly translated that into a market value, uh, just to emphasize that this is a huge sum of money that you can get from an efficiency increase. Uh, so, so you don't need to hit these limits to get a big economic benefit. You can just get a small improvement and you can get a whole lot of money. And very often you'll learn something interesting along the way as well. Uh, so just to really emphasize this idea that solar cells have a threshold and below the threshold they're transparent. This is a picture of a dye solar cell that is transparent for red light. And you can actually see the sky right through it. Uh, usually the transparency is in the infrared where you can't see it. Um, so this is a, a laboratory example of a fusion system here. So what's going on is there's a red laser beam coming from this mirror and traveling towards the background target. And along the way, it passes through the fusion material and the red laser beam is getting converted into a yellow laser, yellow luminescence, not a laser at all. And uh, this is a really dramatic visual example of the spontaneous increase in energy that occurs in fusion systems. 
Uh, I want to be really clear though, that's an increase in energy per photon, not an increase in the total energy. And so all of the laws of physics are completely obeyed. Um, so this is the, the energy level diagram of the fusion system, which is a little bit um, tricky because it's got sort of a five step process. Um, so what happens first is you have your light coming in from the sun, it's passed through the solar cell, and that is captured in our first type of molecule, which we call a sensitizer. That's typically some kind of porphyrin derivative, any molecule that, that absorbs really strongly um, and has several other interesting properties can be used. So this is a, an example from Max Crossley's group here. Um, and then the sensitizer has been chosen so that once it captures the energy, it, it will go undergo intersystem crossing. So that's changing from a singlet state to a triplet state. What that's really all about is storing the energy in the sensitizer molecule. Um, next, we need to have a second kind of molecule involved, which we're going to call the emitter molecule. Um, and here's an example of a tetracine derivative. Um, but many of the molecules that Girish was talking about earlier have um, been used for this purpose, or they have close relatives. So um, Bodipi, uh, anthracene, or perylene-related molecules can be good emitters. Um, anyway, what we're doing with the emitter first is we're taking the energy from the sensitizer's triplet state, where it's been stored, and transferring it through an electron exchange process to an emitter molecule. Um, all of this needs to happen many, many times in parallel in order for the system to work. So we end up with lots and lots of emitter molecules that are all in that first excited state. And when two of those first excited states meet up, they will annihilate. And that results in one of the molecules being in a second excited state and the other molecule being in the ground state. And uh, we, we picked these emitter molecules to be a type that tends to fluoresce very well, um, like the perylenes that Girish was just discussing. And so then we get our final photon out. So big summary here was that you absorb two photons and you get one photon out. And along the way, there's a series of steps, all of which lose a little bit of energy along the way. So it's exothermic and that's really important. Um, now I'm gonna move on to the computational methods that we use to make predictions about device performance. So when we're doing this, um, we start out with and illumination spectrum. So usually that means that we're just taking the standard solar spectrum uh, from the book, but you could use our software to model some alternative illumination if you so wish. Um, and then we use the sensitizer absorption. So this is coming from UV viz. Very important to accurately calibrate the concentration of your sample when you do this, because we're really interested in the absorption of each molecule um, and then we, we did the same thing for the emitter absorption. That's not nearly as important, but we include it because it's easy and you can see a slightly more precise answer. Um, the emitter emission is used to figure out what the photoluminescence looks like. Um, we use the band gap of the solar cell to determine which photons are captured by a solar cell and which pass through. And then we use some rate constants, which are coming from time results spectroscopy experiments. And finally, geometry. Geometry is quite simple. So our, our device model is like this. You have sunlight, sunlight coming down from the top. And there's a solar cell as the top layer. And it either captures light or it doesn't. And the light that it doesn't capture goes through to the next layer, which I call the anabathma 4. So I got a um, expert in Greek to help me with this one. Uh, so you, you know about fluorophores, chromophores, lumophores, phosphors, and so on. Uh, so this is just the version that means upward going. So it, it causes increase of energy in photons, uh, and it consists of both the sensitizer and emitter together. Uh, and then finally, there's a reflector, and the reflector is just any white object, which is used to distribute light that isn't captured the first time passing through the device. Um, anyway, the, the main geometric consideration here is just the thickness of the anabathma 4 that converts the light. And using the Beer-Lambert law, we're going to find that that's really, really important to making an efficient device. Um, the whole process here for calculating is fairly straightforward. Uh, we just use a statistical sampling from the illumination spectrum to get an accurate estimate of what the light coming in is like. And then we use the Beer-Lambert law for modeling the absorption. And we're just using a discrete version here and again, taking random samples. Um, then there is a reflector 
again, we use a statistical model for that uh, just to simulate the scattering from a white surface. And then we simulate the fluorescence. And this is where the fusion related physics turns up. Um, so the fluorescence is the yield times the light absorbed, essentially. And uh, it's written in terms of rate constants. So what we have at the top in the numerator is the rate of fusion, which consists of a rate constant that describes both the diffusion properties of the quanta in the system and also the annihilation properties of the quanta. And then this is the concentration of the excitons, which are the, the quanta that we're interested in. Uh, and then in the numerator, in the denominator of this e equation here, we have got all of the processes that cause the loss of excitons. So we have intrinsic loss and then annihilation loss. And there's a factor of two to account for the fact that we're turning two quanta into one. Um, so this is bad losses. This is annihilation rate constant, and this is the concentration of triplet excitons. Uh, all right, the whole thing gets recomputed several times to account for recycling. So what that means is when there's fluorescence, <laughs> then we want to check and see if it makes it to the solar cell. And if it doesn't make it to the solar cell, it's going to get absorbed in some molecule. And at that point, it could potentially be reused. Um, so this is, if you account for this detail, you get a little bit more precise answer than you would have if you didn't. Um, finally, we total up how many of our random samples actually end up in the solar cell. <coughs> and we express that as a current density. Um, so what's going on here is we're assuming that all the photons that are actually captured by the solar cell are converted to an electrical current. Um, in an actual device, what you would measure would be the, the current after the losses of the solar cell, and those are not accounted for because we're, we're studying here fusion system and not the solar cell system. Um, anyway, so that's what we call our figure of merit. It's photons in units of current density. All right, um, so this software is all freely available now. Um, and you might want to use it if, say, you're an organic chemist and you make molecules and you want to use absorption spectroscopy from your handy UV viz to predict the photocurrent. Um, so you've got a candidate molecule. Maybe it absorbs really well, or maybe it's really fluorescent. And you want to see how well will it will work for this application. Um, so we can just spit out a figure of merit for that. Um, if you are a quantum chemistry person or a machine learning person, and you want to predict the spectra of molecules and relate that to a photocurrent and say, you know, how useful would this be in a device? Uh, you can use our code to do that. Uh, if you're a person who measures rate constants and you want to re relate your discovery in your time resolved spectroscopy lab to application, our software is good for that. And if you're somebody who makes devices and you want to know which geometry to build, then this can help you as well. So here's a, an example from one of our papers where if you change the thickness of the device, the efficiency has a really strong peak. If you make the device the correct thickness, nearly all laboratory experiments are over here at the rightmost edge where they're getting significantly lower efficiency than they could with a simple geometric change. I, I personally would really not want to have to make devices with all these different thicknesses. Um, there's great technology for making thin films, but in pretty much all situations, making a film of every thickness is really a nuisance. So it's very handy to use the computer to help us. Um, so I'm going to give a couple of examples of how this can be used to give us some insight here into performance. And I'm going to start out by looking at the combination of the zinc octaethyl porphyrin and diphenyl anthracene. So this particular system is sort of notorious for not working very well. And I'm going to try to explain some of why that is. Um, you know, in particular, people really like to compare the zinc octaethyl porphyrin with the platinum octaethyl porphyrin. And they find the platinum octaethyl porphyrin works a lot better. Um, and that's a little inconvenient because platinum is expensive. And you know, so people say things like, oh, um, you know, platinum is a heavy metal, and it causes a lot of spin orbit coupling which will then allow the porphyrin to 
easily change from its singlet state to triplet state, and that, that really helps with energy storage. Um, but if you look at it, actually, the porphyrins that don't have zinc or platinum already are very good at turning to their triplet states. So that really can't explain it. Um, people also say, okay, well, the diphenyl anthracene has this rotating molecule on it, and that's somehow, it's like rotating group on it, and that is somehow affecting the performance of the device. But that doesn't explain why zinc and platinum perform differently. Um, so I'm just going to give it away and say our explanation is that the energy transfer from the zinc porphyrin to the diphenyl anthracene isn't exothermic. And um, that's the reason why, why it doesn't work. And so there's no real fundamental reason why you need to have some very expensive platinum in your device. Um, you can just change your emitter molecule, the diphenyl anthracene, to a slightly larger molecule and thereby get more efficient energy transfer. Um, and in fact, that has, has been done uh, and it does make a much better device. All right, so on the right-hand side here, we've simulated different um, energy differences between the sensitizer triplet state and the emitter triplet state. So if it's positive here, that's exothermic. And if it's negative, that's endothermic, which we don't want. And what we found here is that as you increase, increase the emitter concentration in your device, if there's a lot more emitter molecules than sensitizer molecules, you will generally get some energy transfer from the sensitizers to the emitters. That's just Boltzmann statistics. Um, and what that means is that your decay rate, which is the dashed curves, goes down. That's the bad decays because the, the porphyrin sensitizer has a lot of energy loss due to the high spin orbit coupling, um, which is necessary, but at this point inconvenient. And then the emitter not having nearly as much spin orbit coupling um, has much better energy storage. So when you get more emitter concentration, you get more of your excited states in the place where they can be stored. Um, now, if you go endothermic, then you have to do this at much higher concentrations. And that results in a significant reduction in the figure of merit, which is the solid line. All right, so if we just assume this is exothermic, we can now use the computer to pick device parameters. So instead of looking at the emitter concentration, I'm gonna take a look at the sensitizer concentration and I'm gonna look at different thicknesses of the device. So this is all about light capture. Typical experiments occur around this area of the graph. So relatively high thicknesses and relatively low concentrations. Um, so if you use this model, then what you're going to find here is you can get tremendously higher efficiency if you go up to higher sensitizer concentrations and smaller thicknesses. Um, and the smaller thickness, by the way, is gonna save you money because you don't need as much material. Um, there's a little bit of a complication because uh, Elham, who spoke in December, showed that when you change the sensitizer concentration, you're actually changing the rate constants, um, the bad one, the loss constant, in the emitter molecule. Um, so the decay rate of the emitter molecule goes up. Uh, what's plotted here, though, in the dash curve is the combined decay rate of the excitons distributed across both the sensitizer and emitter. So what we're seeing here is with, with if you don't account for this additional concentration quenching that Ilham has shown exists, um, then you get increasing figure of merit with concentration and decreasing rate constant. If you do account for this concentration quenching phenomenon, then as the emitter concentration goes up, your decay rate increases. And now your figure of merit, which is what we really care about, has a peak at some particular emitter concentration. Um, and we can also do these calculations with different sensitizer concentrations and thicknesses. So this is the graph I showed before. And then here we have the con quenching constant accounted for. And you can see that our area of very high performance is now killed by the sensitizer quenching the emitter. Um, so probably inducing some spin orbit coupling across a pair of molecules. Um, and that there's a peak in the performance around this area, uh, which is considerably better than what people are doing in an experiment. So this suggests that the experiments can still be substantially improved just by adjusting the sensitizer concentration and the thickness. Um, and 
yes, this is a, a experimentally achievable sensitizer concentration, our experiments actually go a little bit beyond the edge of this graph in practice. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the, the section about picking the optimal quantum dot. Um, so this is you know, inorganic, organic hybrid. Um, what we're doing here is we're replacing our traditional porphyrin sensitizer with a quantum dot, which has the advantage of extremely high absorption, um, but also the disadvantage that it absorbs the light we want to get out to. And it turns out that that's a good trade-off to make. Um, so anyway, we're having these, these quantum dots absorb light and then they're transferring energy to an emitter molecule. And when you have two of those emitter molecules excited, the excited states annihilate to produce a higher energy excited state, which makes luminescence, and that goes back to your solar cell. Um, same overall architecture. Um, and this is something that was, was demonstrated by Elham um, experimentally. And here we're looking at what's the best way to design it. Um, so it's really handy that the molar absorption coefficient has already been you know, published in great detail. So we have, have taken that existing data and we used it with our model. Um, and we are using, in particular, lead sulfide quantum dots. There are many kinds of quantum dots, but lead sulfide is very probably the best known one for this sort of application. So um, it's infrared tunable. Bulk lead sulfide has a really small band gap. Uh, so you can get your quantum dot to absorb pretty much anywhere in the spectrum that you so please. Um, the band edges are degenerate. And that means that the absorption is a bit stronger than you might expect in some other kinds of semiconductor structures. And um, it has pretty good elemental abundance. Um, and there's, there's many published synthesis procedures for this. So it's, it's a well-established material. Now, what we're doing here is we're sort of looking at this area of the spectrum here. And the black curve is the solar spectrum. And I really wanted to point out that there are some significant gaps in the solar spectrum as measured at the Earth's surface. And this is caused by the overtones of water in the atmosphere. So um, light passes through the atmosphere from the sun to the Earth surface. And along the way, it's exciting some higher order vibrational states in some water molecules. Um, what we are doing here is we are changing the quantum dot size to try and figure out how we can get the best results um, by you know, avoiding these areas that have very little light thanks to the water in the atmosphere. Um, so if, if the quantum dot is too small, then um, the light really gets captured by the solar cell. And if you make it a little bit bigger, then the light is captured by the water in the atmosphere. If you make it just right, you get great conversion efficiency. And if you make your quantum dot too big, then you're moving the absorption peak into another region where the light is blocked by the water in the atmosphere. Um, so it turns out that these, these really little details about what stuff is in the atmosphere actually could be economically very significant. Um, so these are our figure of merit results here. Um, you know, typical best laboratory device right now is about 0.1 milliamp per square centimeter. Um, so we're, we're predicting about 10 times better than that. We've got two different classes of predictions here. One is for assuming 100 micromolar concentration of quantum dots. Um, that's significantly lower than what we usually assume for porphyrins, which makes it a little bit harder. Um, and then there's the close packed model. So this is assuming that the Kepler theorem um, for close packed spheres applies, plus we add a little bit of fudge room because there's some organic stuff around the quantum dots. Um, so th this is sort of like imagining that you've achieved a solid phase device. This is a liquid phase device that's probably much, much easier to achieve experimentally. Um, and on the horizontal axis here is the size of the quantum dot. And we do see a really nice peak here. And that corresponds to when the absorption of the quantum dot is really aligned with this area of high solar spectral irradiance. All right. Um, so that was calculations for silicon solar cells, which are the ones that you're going to see on the market right now. Um, in the future, you might see some perovskite solar cells or organic solar cells. Those tend to have a much higher threshold for light capture. Um, so we've also gone ahead and accounted for that. And what we find here is, you know, as expected, the figure of merit goes up a whole lot as you have a larger solar cell band gap. So what that's saying is, as your solar cell gets worse, it lets more light through. 
and therefore there is more light we can convert and get a higher figure of mag. So, so you don't want to pick your solar cell based on what's going to get the highest figure of mag for light fusion, because the solar cell is always going to be more efficient um, as the light fusion process relies on the efficiency of the solar cell. Uh, so, so really you want to optimize your solar cell first, and then after that, you want to look at this and see, well, what gain can I get from using a lead sulfide sensitized fusion system with the solar cell? Um, so if you're perovskites, you're probably somewhere around here, and you can get a really big gain. And if you're at silicon, you can get quite a good gain. Um, so we, we think that this is possibly around 10 times the cost of the film. Um, economic estimates are wildly inaccurate in the past, but that's the best we've got. Um, anyway, so this is showing the best radius and there's a, a, a discontinuity here. So in this area, larger quantum dots always work better. So you just need to figure out uh, if your quantum dot gets really big, does it become colloidally unstable or does it have too many trap states? And if, if so, don't do that. Um, once you get to these wider band gap solar cells, you're actually tuning two different peaks in the quantum dot absorption spectrum to match two different areas of high solar spectral irradiance uh, to get the very best result. Um, but what, what's really great about this method is you, you don't need to know where these peaks are. You just try everything in the computer and it tells you what's the best quantum dot to use. Um, all right. So, you know, the really takeaways here is, you know, precision synthesis really matters. Um, the, the size of the quantum dot needs to be controlled extremely precisely. We're just talking about adding and removing a few atoms. Uh, fortunately, the quantum dot synthesis community has gotten really good at controlling this. Um, and we're predicting really large figure of merit. I'm going to skip over the questions because it looks like we're a little short on time. I'm just go straight to the conclusions. Um, you know, there's a potential here to make solar cells substantially more efficient. Um, 10 percentage points in theory, but if you can get a much smaller increase, it's probably worth it economically to do so. Um, the devices really have to be exothermic, so you need to choose your molecules. Um, one of the challenges here is that we usually don't have great precision on measuring the energy levels of a lot of molecules. That's something that we should really be looking as a community to improve. Um, so the precision needs to be KT, not just whatever your um, absorption peak is. Um, all right, so um, effective light capture is really critical to performance. It's definitely worth it to give up a lot of other good properties to improve your light capture in your fusion system. Um, currently, the lead calcogenite quantum dots are our best candidate. You need to synthesize them to be the right size, and you need to make your device the right shape. Um, doing all of those things experimentally is an enormous pain, but fortunately, we can really calculate efficiently what all the possibilities are and find out what happens. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Laszlo, for another interesting talk. Um, I'll very quickly, I'm conscious of time, but I'll very quickly open up. Does anyone have any questions for our speaker? Uh, please unmute your microphone or you can throw questions into the chat. Um, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just have a question regarding the intensity of the, if this uh, technique uh, require a threshold intensity for the fusion or uh, hard fission of the incident light. Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so there are lots of papers that talk about the threshold and making it smaller. But I want to be very clear that what they're talking about is not a threshold for it to start working. Um, mm. This process works as long as there are at least two photons present. It has some probability of working, um, low probability. And then it gradually increases in performance. When people talk about a threshold in the system, what they're talking about is a threshold between one regime of inefficiency and another regime of a little bit less inefficiency. Um, so I, I prefer to call that a transition rather than a threshold. Um, so lots of papers about that, which I, I didn't include any of that stuff here though. Thank you. All right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we, we've gone past uh, 
past the hour. So I, I think we, in the interest of time, we'll need to stop there. So thank you very much uh, to both of our speakers uh, for interesting talks today. Um, and we will see you all back uh, next month for another um, set of uh, talks. So thanks, everyone. Uh, and see you later.